Hello everyone, welcome back to episode 13 of Night Call. So we ran into the mad lady again, we, who we seem to have cut off this time again too. So I don't really remember what happened in the... F I'm just gonna check real quick. Um, so where was she? It's her. You have met Ludivine, Ludiv things didn't go so well, but they ended up okay. Something is still locked. So do we have to like challenge it that it won't go well? Is that the missing thing? I don't know. I wouldn't be happy about that though because I don't I don't want to be mean. Can I help you? I don't know yet. Although the real question is how can you help yourself? Do we know each other? Gives a sour laugh. Don't play innocent with me. If I were to say to you, her voice is slightly raspy with an oddly metallic sound. October 27th. Shall I just pick the mean answer now? I don't know. I, let's try. Very funny. Absolutely hilarious. Her voice is increasingly aggressive. You can feel the anger bubbling inside her. I'm a sub-editor, Mr. Uh, taxi Driver. So did I tell her about the attack last time? Maybe I should apologize. Maybe that's... What's missing? I'm truly sorry. I don't remember what happened that evening. I put your life in danger. Sorry for everything that happened. Your car, your ex, the job. Sorry. Even though it's not my fault. <laughs> well, I don't know if it was my fault or not. Let's just say nothing else. Let's just keep quiet. Shit. She is aside, dispelling her anger all at once. Was that the real you speaking? Her voice has slowed down. It was... Smile lights up her face. It was exactly what I needed to hear. I've been thinking about it for months, going over and over it every second of the accident. Telling myself it could have been different, less complicated. More, I mean less, well, you know. Actually, I don't, uh, I don't know. Let's just understand her. I don't know. Good. Good, good, good. Thanks. All her anger has evaporated. No more looks that could kill, simmering rage or grinding teeth. My boyfriend was a jerk anyway, and then this job. Maybe it wasn't so great. She gives you a little smile. Okay, I think we already know that. So now we lost our hacker guy. But I think I want to drive Krooky now. And this time I won't screw it up. I mean, I know where he got his money from, so I guess he got some money. Yeah, okay. Just gonna drive the cat. Okay, fine, I'll take you. So, this time we're taking him. You let out a sigh. Okay, fine. You start talking to yourself in low tones as if to balance the conversation. Normal. It's perfectly normal. You start the cab, but cast a glance at the cat behind you. You're the one who ordered the cab? You start to laugh. A few minutes go by, you try to break the ice. Simple questions are probably best. Everything okay? Neither a yes or a no, more of a plaintive meow. Are you meeting someone? Maybe I should have asked if he was running away from someone. Maybe Francine wasn't so great after all. No, that's not it. The cat is staring at you. The conversation seems to bore him. <laughs> you seem to be well fed. Pretty strange, I must say. Did someone hurt you? Plaintive meow, you sigh. Your owner? Another meow, but longer and deeper. More heartfelt. You nod your head happened? Was it a man? No answer. A woman? What does she mean to you? The cat seems to be uncertain. Huh, I mean we know Francine so we know that she was overly affectionate. The cat lets out a string of insistent meows. Touché, that's it. She's too affectionate? That's why you're running away? <laughs> oh my god! That is even worse! 
The cat is watching you with a steady eye. You're sure you're on the right track. You have to be careful with people like that. They suffocate you before you even know it. You nod your head. But you, you ran away and meet lots of people like you. You stop short. But you're just... just a cat. You roll your eyes. Behind you, the cat lets out a quiet, reassuring meow. Go on. What I mean is, well, we don't even know we are in a cage. We prefer not to think about it. We're never fully aware of it. You look at the cat. I must be crazy. I'm talking to a... You shake your head. You point to a light in the distance. St. Lazare will be there soon. A few years later, you stop at the drop-off area in front of the station. First train doesn't leave for another hour. Where are you going? The cat stares at you without making a noise. Let me get... Let him go? Let me guess. Saint Lazare. If you were going to the suburbs of Paris, you wouldn't have needed to come into town. So somewhere in the northwest of France. Normandy? Somewhere by the sea, huh? The cat is looking at you and meows. Sharp sound. Probably a yes. A very hungry yes. For the fish, I guess. You check the time on the dashboard. It's time to go to get a real customer. <laughs> you try not to think too much about the situation you're in and you hope that no one sees you talking to a cat. Mm. I want to know more. I'll just start saying the names of cities and you meow when I hit the right one. You start to list cities in Normandy. The cat doesn't move a muscle. Cherbourg. The cat looks up. So it's Cherbourg. Getting close. Saint Malo. Still nothing. I've got it. Deauville. A meow of delight. You're smiling too. All of a sudden, you're exhausted. Okay, come on. Time to say goodbye. You get out of the cab and open the back door. A bill has appeared on the seat next to the cat. It is enough for the fare and more. Crook even tipped us. Well, you're full of surprises, aren't you? I won't ask you where it came from. I know where it came from. You smile and lean over to pet the cat. It leaps out of the car and darts between your legs. You can just make out its shape dashing up a flight of stairs and slipping between the bars of a gate. You get back in the car. You look at yourself in the rear of your mirror. Your features are heavy with fatigue. Your right eyelid is twitching. As, your heart, as you start the car, you remember you're allergic to cats, but you haven't sneezed once. You pull out of the station. Thanks, Crookie. Oh, wow. I mean, that is even worse. Now we know the truth. Crookie actively ran away from her, her friend scene because he didn't want it to be with her anymore. So that leaves the question. If we ever meet Francine again, shall we still tell her the truth and tell her exactly where Crookie is now that we know that he ran away from her because she was too affectionate? Or shall we really just lie? That's interesting. <laughs> That is really interesting. Okay, I'm really happy that I drove Kruki. Oh, it's our third ride with her. With them. I just gotta do this. This will be the third this will be the third ride and then we will know. Problem is I'm spending too much time on getting to know the others. I without even knowing. Uh, what the hell? I think I never had this before. And I, I, I clicked too fast. Oh my god, I don't know. Say nothing? What the hell? Did they just want me as their donor? He's the right age, he seems to be healthy, he's intelligent. What did I do different this time? I don't know. Uh, say nothing? And most importantly, he's been understanding and honest every time we've taken his cab. Um, what the hell? So are you interested or not? What? Proposal seems so peculiar, so bizarre. Both women are staring at you. It seems like the older of the two, M, short for Emily, no doubt, is changing her mind too. If you say yes, she'll say yes. If you say no, she'll quiet her wife down and nothing will happen. But you know it's a really bad idea. You're on a trail of a killer and your future... It's impossible. What? Why? You sigh. Your wife? Tell the truth? 
Oh my god, I'm so sorry that I didn't read it before. I need to slow it down. I, I, I definitely need to read it again. I hope I didn't click too fast. Whew! Okay, um... I don't know what to do. I feel so honored. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. Tell the truth. Appear shocked. I'll think about it. Tell the truth. Uh, no, it's just... You park in front of the building. I'm not going to be around much longer. I have some business to take care of, then I'm out of here. The younger woman is going to say something when her partner interrupts. There's no need to explain. She hands you the fare, plus a tip. I'm very sorry, we... She turns towards her wife and gives her a little push. Oh, come on. Out of here. They get out of the cab. The drunker of the two stumbles. Her wife just about manages to catch her. Is everything alright? Oh my... I didn't... That didn't happen the last time, but I don't know. I didn't give any different answers. And it started exactly the same as it was before, like the the with the musician guy and they don't didn't know what to pick. Was it because there's one yes or no answer? Maybe that I pick different Wow. Oh wow. Okay. It's kind of hard to concentrate to, I don't know, still keep up with the talking. When you when you're kind of sure that you know everything already. Uh, oh well, um, I kind of want to go there because we need some answers. Wow, you park in front of the Passy Cemetery. You're greeted by large columns and a huge dark iron door. The door opens and you see your old buddy Marco. Marco, the one who stole your wife. Oh, it's Marco again. <laughs> you flash your headlights at him. He waves you over. You get out of your cap and join him. Buddy, can't believe you found my number. Honestly, how crazy. Yeah, how crazy. I just visited you your home in another universe too he fakes enthusiasm and serenity but his shaking hands betray him have you been to the cemetery before it's stunning uh, no marco wait come on he turns on his flashlight and you start to wander among the tombstones the cemetery is clean with straight lines of graves it's very old oh cold i'm not gonna lie to you it freaks me out a little that you want to know stuff about the cult oh well, doesn't Marco know a lot? Especially since last time. I don't know if you remember last time, but I lost my job, man. You keep bringing that up, but you also stole my wife. I lost everything. He freezes and grabs your arm. Man, I swear, I don't want to lose what I've got here. The cemetery watchman, I've got a gorgeous gal. You mean my wife? Also, how fast do you switch jobs? Um, so that was this nighttime, so answer my questions. <laughs> I don't care. I lo looked like you asked me to, they're over there. He brings you a few meters further over to a strange tombstone. There's an evergreen growing where the patch of grass should normally be. Something is carved into the bark. You lean over. The flashlight illuminates the name of Sita Velpo, the third victim. Okay, so the third victim was a cult member. This is where her ashes are buried, along with the other members of the Mooney Tunes cult. Don't think that's what they're called. Uh, the cult? He glances around like he heard a suspicious noise. I see them every once in a while. They come to plant flowers and collect old bouquets. What are they like? Man, they're hippies, nothing more. They're all like 70 years old at least. They talk about tantric love and wildflower infusions. He leans over to you like he has a secret to tell. I don't really get what you've got against them. I've got nothing against them. He takes a step back. No way, man. You can tell me that, that, that after asking me to... He starts to whine. 
Oh, just another lo loser plan that's gonna get me fired. I can see it coming. Come on, we're just visiting the graveyard. He shines his flashlight towards the cemetery entrance. Oh, come on, let's get out of here before the neighbors call the cops. When I do my rounds half the time, they think it's kids coming to spray paint the tombs. You follow Marco through the stones. In the glow of his flashlight, you catch glimpses of portraits of unassuming faces that ignore you. Once you get to the entrance, Marco turns his light off. Oh, please, oh please, seriously, don't tell anyone I let you in. If my bosses find out, I'll be out on my ass, please. You shrug. No problem. The wife stealer sighs. You walk away without another word and get into your taxi. Once inside, in the warmth, you take a second to think about the new information you received before driving away. Okay, well... So that cult thing... Wait a second, the cook is part of the cult, and the cult thing is kind of a hippie clan, so... So, this is the priest, as far as I know, and this is the nanny. I can make amends with Miriam because I misclicked once and I didn't see what she was saying. So I can say that I remember her now. That's good, that's good. Oh, so she pays really good as well. Yes, it's also really good. Oh, okay, she knows something too. Having a good evening? Yeah, yeah. She falls silent again, the silence lasts a few seconds. As you know, blah blah, we already know that. May I ask you something? She leans forward slightly. We, uh, you and I have already talked. You may not remember, but I was babysitting for an Iranian family, and she leaves her sentence hanging. Okay, yes, of course. Now we know her. She smiles, though her eyes tell you she's not entirely sure you're telling the truth. It's not at all the same situation, anyway. These are new clients. I think they hit their son. Whoa, what? Now that's a new story. Her sentence vanishes without a trace. They hit their son? She nods slowly. I've been taking care of this kid twice a week, sometimes more, for three or four months. At first I found him to be really fearful. He whined a lot, always moaning for no reason. Last week I had to give him a bath and he had bruises all over his thighs. They were huge. So I asked his mom about it tonight. She stops herself like something is holding her back. What did she say? She swallows. That he fell at school. That it was nothing to worry about. But I don't know. She was lying? She raises her gaze to meet yours. Hard to say. She seemed sincere, but... It's just that there was this awkward pause before she replied. Your passenger sits in silence for a minute. You can tell she's torn. Of course, maybe she's a little paranoid. Maybe she thinks I think she hits her kid when that's actually not the case at all. Her eyes wander outside. She's holding something back. Is there more? She almost seems surprised and relieved. Uh, yes. There's a closet in their bedroom. More of a walk-in closet, actually. She shakes her head, talking about this is making her uncomfortable. In the closet, there's a cabinet where she keeps her shoes. Over the whole base of the cabinet, there's like a little pillow. And there's even a little latch on the outside to lock the door shut. Like a... A dog cage. Think they locked their kid up? She doesn't answer right away. You can tell she's struggling to find the words. When she starts speaking again, her voice is lower, more poised. Maybe I'm just imagining things, going way the hell overboard. You know, babysitting is not a very hard job. 
I feed the kids, put them to bed, and if there aren't any problems, I get to watch Netflix until midnight. She looks at you pointedly. I mean, it's kind of like your job, right? And nothing exciting ever happens. Oh, well, it's a bit more complicated than that. She sinks back into the seat. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. You shake your head, and in passing notice something odd about her voice. Like an outdated accent. What do you do when it happens? You look at her for a second. I help them, to the best of my ability. Nothing much, but a bit of advice, sometimes a little help. Does it happen often? <laughs> Just smile. Uh, sometimes. She smiles at you. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean... I've never been in this kind of situation before, and... Should I go to the police? Her question surprises you. I don't know if they'll know what... I think I have to. But if I do and I'm wrong, I'm finished. Maybe they'll even sue me for slander or something. True, it could turn out badly for you. But... But what? Is this really what you want to do with your life? Babysitting? No, definitely not. Then maybe... She cuts you off, the tone of her voice changes. Uh, yes, you're right. Silence fills the cap and the young woman in the back seat who has been cold and stoic since the beginning of your conversation begins to shake. The ride continues in silence. Ever, ever once in a while the young lady opens her mouth, breathes in, but doesn't make a sound. Not a single sound. When you reach your destination it's like she's unable to speak. Oh wow. What was that motion just now? She pays her fare and jumps out of the cab. You watch her as she walks into her building. She disappears into the lobby. You let out a sigh. Oh, wow. Okay, well, that was tough. So the whole story changed just because we remembered her. Oh, wow. That's really... That's a really tough matter now. <laughs> because, I don't know, I, I kind of understand the struggle because... It must be hard for for parents when like your kid really hurts themselves on accident while falling down because kids fall down. <laughs> That's part of childhood and then they hurt themselves and yeah, sometimes they get some nasty bruises and cuts or whatever, but just from playing and not because their parents hit them, but I guess it must be pretty hard for parents too when you think about it that other people could interpret it as you hitting your kids and then hiding it when saying, oh yeah, he fell down at the playground or something. But on the other hand, I mean, I get the struggle that Miriam is in because, yeah, it would be horrible if she just accused, if she went to the police and accused the parents of hitting their child, which is horrible. And, but then in the end, it didn't happen. But on the other hand, if she says nothing, then the poor child will get tormented by his parents. And she would have the chance to save him. So it's tough. So I wonder if we see Miriam again now, because I would really like to know what happens. I also see that here's a point to see. So if we're going to go there. You look the Belvedere over. It's a rather unassuming bar that had its heyday at the end of the 1980s. The exterior decor is over the top, molding with embedded statues, fake ivy painted along the walls. It's probably even worse inside. You glance at the time, they're about to close, must be a small party. You leave your cap, walk towards the bar and push the door open. Dim lighting, almost no one here. Not even that one passenger of yours, the one you often drive here, is in tonight. You walk over to the bar. A young woman, no more than 20, looks slyly at you. There are dozens of kinds of liquor behind her. We're closing. She's putting class glasses away. They clink in her hands. Uh, I have some questions for you. She freezes and looks you in the eye. When she starts speaking, her tone is icy cold. What do you want to know? Is it about the angel of death's victims? Yeah, actually it is. You wait a second. Which victims? The first two victims, the fireman and the vegan activist.
activist one. Simon Columb and Jules Lima. Ah, so it is a mistake in 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 Hervé's um, thing because the second victim now is apparently Jules Lima. They came in a lot. They were good clients, regulars. Simon didn't drink, but he liked the atmosphere. Jules was kind of an ass with the staff, but he often... Oh, okay, so it is an he? He often brought dates here. He was a hard worker, really smart guy. She leans over. But I know something else. It's not something I tell just anyone. She slides her elbows across the bar until she's less than a meter from you. 150 euros and I'll tell you who knew Jules and Simon very well. Well, I'm lucky to have money now, so here you go, lady. You pay her, she slides the bills between her fingers. Apollonie Girardot, a regular. She's like a fixture here. She likes them young and I know she scored with Simon, with Simon and Jules. She and the fireman had a thing way back then. But she was too sketchy for him. She's part of the Mooney Tunes, you know what that is. The cult. Precisely. She nods her head and tops it off with a wink. I've got to get back to work. Hope that was helpful. Me too. A few seconds later, you're back in your taxi. You take a minute to think about this new intel. You wonder if you're moving in the right direction. A group of teens crosses the street. One trips on a curb and wipes out on a sidewalk. His friends laugh at him. You start driving and leave them behind. Okay, so that was interesting. Because now the weird lady does make sense again. And also it seems like the weird lady is in a cult as well. I thought that when, when Marco said the Mooney Tunes or whatever, that he was just misusing the name of the cult of the cook. But it seems like there's another cult in town. I think I'm gonna go to the gas station. Maybe we can find something out when talking to the guy there. And then let's see who we can transport last for today. Okay, let's leave it at that. And now let's talk to the guy. You examine the newspaper and magazine covers. The serial killer is on the front page of all of them. It's crazy, isn't it? I think they'd have caught him by now. Clark smiles. You recognize the twinkle in his eyes. This guy has something to tell you. Yes, thank you. Have a good evening. Okay, so we should have one more drive. And then it's good. Who the hell is this? The ultra skaters? What the hell? Okay, well then let's drive them. They don't pay a lot, but whatever. You pull your cab up to the sidewalk and lean over. Your next passengers are in a dark alleyway just off the main street. They are, how to put it, in the skies. As four superheroes in spandex suits stretched over their bodies. Whoa! They remind you of a show from your childhood. Uh, think about the show. <laughs> Call your passengers. You roll down your window and call your passengers. One of them dressed in pink looks up. He or she staggers over to the taxi and makes an attempt to poke his or her head through the window. The helmet bangs against the metal frame and they're grown in surprise. <laughs> hey, if you break my car, you're gonna pay it. You're a driver? It's a he, and even with his helmet on, you can smell the stench of booze on his breath. Oh, great. Oh, that's not a great superhero team. Yeah. He turns around in his pink suit. Hey guys, hey! The rest of the group turns around. It's our cab! A yelp of joy comes from the alleyway. All four suited passengers get into the car, one after the other. The aroma of beer and piss wafts into the cab. <laughs> now I'm pretty sure that it's not legal to have four people on the back seat, but okay. Okay, man, I'll be brief. We lost ultra yellow. We don't know where she's hiding. <laughs> Oh well, that sucks. 
The one dressed in green starts screaming in a taxi, a deep male voice with a southern accent. We're drunk! Uh, yeah, yeah, like, we didn't know already. Uh, you wanna look for her? Oh, you don't wanna look for her, we have to find her. Dramatic pause, he extends a shaking finger and points to the roof. Ultra- oh shit, I don't feel so good. Yellow is the one with the keys to our hotel room. Oh wow, you don't even live here. Ultra pink clears his throat like it might be a technique for getting the alcohol out of the system quicker. Anyway, you, could you just drive around the neighborhood slowly? She can't be far. The one in red silent up until now raises their head. Yeah, dudes, yeah, we're gonna look for her. We're gonna find her and we're gonna get a drink because I'm thirsty, aren't you dudes? A woman's voice or a teenager? You're not sure. Oh, oops. Who's thirsty? Yay, he's filled the cap. Everyone seems up for a drink. Uh, no, you're too drunk. What? What do you mean? We barely had anything to drink. Almost nothing. You're going to puke all over my taxi. Cross my heart, we won't throw up. Actually, we already have and we never throw up. Okay, but cool it with the drinking after. Huh? What do you mean by that? You're too drunk to drink anymore. When you're dealing with drunk passengers, you always use the same firm, confident voice. You find your friend and then you settle down. Ultra pink nods and... Okay, okay, fine, deal. The passengers are overwhelmed with joy, with the exception of the silent one leaning against the window behind you. Yeah, let's go! You start driving. C keep your eyes peeled, guys, okay? Ultra Pink is riddled with hiccups and acid reflux. <laughs> Oops. So where should we start? Uh, we were at Furiosa with Ultra Yellow. We were drinking there until they refused to keep serving us. Fucking Nazi hipsters. Wow. Bring it down a notch. No need to get so excited. Why don't we start there? Maybe she's at the hotel, emptying the mini bar. Lucky duck. Oh yeah, not a bad idea. She's in the little park where we went to drink mead. Oh, that was her. Oops. Sai escapes from the red helmet. The beer was so cheap, it was called beer. Spelled wrong on the label and everything. But, but red is right. Ultra yellow might be in a little park. What should we... Oh, fuck my stomach. Where should we go? Um, let's say the little park. Oh, let's go to the park it is. Maybe she's still there. Uh, no, she was with us at the bar, right? I don't know anymore. They tell you how to find a the park they're talking about and you start the car. In back, they spark up a discussion centering on the following theme. Which country has the best price amount of alcohol ratio? <laughs> you quickly tune them out. You let out a sigh and shake your head, hoping you'll be done with them soon. Pink and red vote for Bulgaria. Green shouts that the only right answer is Croatia. As for blue... He hasn't said a word all evening. You're starting to worry. The park finally comes into sight and silent fills the cab. I haven't seen anyone in this park here. You sure it's this one? Yeah, I recognize it. This is where I yacked up my insides. Ew. Great. And yet you're still totally drunk, dude. I'm not that drunk, I'll prove it. I can remember my credit card number. 4434. Four, uh. You find your credit card number when you're drunk? Uh, no, never, except when I'm drunk. <laughs> Silence in the cab. Does anyone have a fucking idea? You clear your throat. Can we try the hotel? Yeah, the hotel. She might already have crashed. Maybe she hooked up with someone. Shit, yeah. Okay, let's go. You start driving, a mild migraine taking over your head. You start driving to the address the pink guy gave you. Behind you, the discussion is getting out of hand. Pink and red think they never should have eaten at the sushi restaurant. Green is screaming that yellow is totally nuts anyway. As for blue, he still hasn't said anything. You watch him in the rearview mirror. If you go by the way his head is lolling, he starts to fall asleep. A few minutes later, you pull up in front of the hotel. It's the kind of place that tries really hard to appear classy. The flowers in the entryway are clearly artificial. Ok, 
Okay, so what's the plan? I'm going to ask if she's there and then we make it up as we go along like we've been doing all night. The pink guy gets out of the taxi leaving you alone with the other three. For a long while you remain silent, a welcome change from green screaming. <laughs> the noise suddenly opens, making everyone jump except Ultra Blue, of course. I haven't seen anyone, she's not there. We'll never find her. Ugh, keep cool. We haven't looked everywhere yet. Alright, what's the name of the bar you left? Ultra Yellow? Uh, the, um... F Furiosa, yeah! That's it, the Furiosa. You smile. I'm sure that's where she is. Yeah, the bar, good idea. Yay! Maybe we could get a nice cold one while we're at it. No, we're going to look for yellow. Plus, they don't want us in there anymore. Do I need to remind you of the scene you made? Someone whispers the address of the bar. It's not far. You start the car and can't help but smile. But wait, guys. Wait just one tiny second. Anyone check the trunk of the cab? Red and pink sigh. God, come on. How can you be more drunk than I am? Did you pop some pills in the toilet again, huh? No, man, no. And they go on to discuss their darkest memories of boozing past. As for Blue, not a peep, you're starting to get worried. Say something. <laughs> hey, say your friend there, is he okay? The discussion in the back of the cab comes to a halt. Who, Ultra Blue? Yeah, yeah, don't worry. He's a silent drunk. Yeah, what he said. Actually, it's the only way to get him to shut up. Um, I was getting worried. Uh, you shouldn't. We're adults were responsible. <laughs> I can see that. Well, more or less responsible. His deep voice disintegrates into a low grumble. But anyway, he's just fine, aren't you, Ultra Blue? No answer from the concerned party. Uh, what's with the costumes, anyway? <laughs> Her costumes? We're ultra warriors from the planet of from, from outer space. Yeah, stop your yelling for a second. They're for a bachelor party, ultra green here's our church friend. You won't be a virgin for much longer. Peels of lather come from the back seat. <laughs> okay, let's laugh with them. They're funny. Five seconds later, silence fills the cab. In back, they're all looking out the windows just in case. There's an odd feeling in the air, like the last day of summer camp. With booze. You finally get to the bar and park where you can. Despite the time, the bar is still full and patrons are scattered across the sidewalk. Hey, look over there! What? What do you see? Well, that's ultra yellow, isn't it? Oh, damn it. I thought that she wasn't at the bar because they were thrown out. They all lean over, except blue, to try and make out the shape in the darkness. What are you talking about? Yes! Ah, <laughs> that must really blow your mind, huh? Not the first try, too bad. We've been wandering around for an hour. We're all thirsty. Stop your... Ah, uh, psh. The pink guy starts fumbling in his spandex pants. <laughs> We're going to go take care of her. I think she needs us. Need any help? They're funny. I hope they pay well. Uh, no, no. You get the impression he's suddenly in a hurry. Thanks for your help, man. We'll take it from here. Yeah, man. Thanks for your help, man. Stop screaming for fuck's sake. Your taxi was like an angel that fell out of the sky into a barrel of beer. Come on, get out. Everyone's had enough of your stinky breath. Oh, that was her again. Damn it. <laughs> Once on the sidewalk, they walk over to their friend and surround her. You focus your attention on your taxi for a while and collect your thoughts. The one guy who was screaming as well your friend. Your head is pounding. You're shaken up. So how did your passengers get under your skin that much? And just as you're leaving the bar behind, you smell something weird. You turn around, Blue left a stain on the back seat. No! It's not really pee, nor is it vomit. It's indescribable. <laughs> no! Ew! You glance outside. Your passengers are no longer in front of the bar. Maybe they went inside to get a drink. You open the windows and start driving. With a bit of luck, it'll be dry before you pick up a new passenger. <laughs> You make a mental note to clean your taxi before the end of your shift. Well, my shift is over, so...
Okay, so I'm really interested if there's anything new with Ludivin. Things didn't go so well. Okay, we had that before. But they ended up okay. Okay, we already had that. You've met Kruki. Yes, I did. Okay, so I should have known a lot about him now. You drove Kruki? Yes, I did. <laughs> that was really shocking. You drove Lucy and Emily a third time, yes. You have met Miriam. You don't rem- What? I did say so! What the hell? And she decides not to say anything. What? She decides not to say anything? Didn't I encourage her to go to the police? Didn't I encourage Miriam to go to the police? I don't know. <sighs> oh well, ooh. Okay, so what do we have here? Oh, they are both members of the Moonflesh cult. But we know now that the Moonflesh cult is basically hippies. But why doesn't it affect her too? <sighs> okay, whatever. Fish symbol drawn of blood. Left spare key on her doormat. Okay, I still don't know what that is about. So, it would be interesting to find out more about this Moonflesh cult. Victim number two is a client of the Belvedere. Okay. He watches you. We don't know what that means. Victim number two opened the door to the killer, which could be also incriminating for Apollonie because she knew them. She was hunting young people and... Victim 4 host refugees in her hotel. Okay. Hmm. Okay, so I think I'm gonna put the Belvedere here too because they know her there. Break in for crime scenes 1 and 3. At the Belvedere, we heard about victims number 1 and 2. Number 1 was, I guess, a firefighter or something which she knew from long ago so maybe he didn't let her in in the end and victim number two was maybe her recent toy or something i don't know could make sense victim number one is also a client of the belvedere cafe yes hmm well that definitely shines a light onto her yeah so let's end the night Oh, it must be Bissé. Oh, is it already time for one to... Yeah. You pick up, Bissé sounds irritated. Okay, I mean, if they rule out the cook now, it will be kind of obvious because she's the only one who is far taller. You know how lucky you are? I'm doing your job for you. No, I'm doing your job for you. Okay, bye. Okay. So who's gone now? Huh. See? I thought so. I thought so. I, I had the suspicion that if, if he really wanted to prove that we live in a computer simulation that he wouldn't like really need to do rituals to kill someone. She's not telling the whole truth. You jump without understanding where the voice is coming from. Outside Paris is waking up. I should stop clicking so fast, but there's just so much that we know f we've read for, I don't know, seven times probably. You open one eye, like this. Okay, so we're already at night four. This is going a lot faster because we are doing a lot of encounters again. So we've actually already been to a lot of bots of interest. There's only one missing, I think. Okay, but we're gonna do this in the next episode. 
until then thank you so much for watching and i will see you next time